in the last lecture we were discussing fluid properties in particular we discussed bernoulli's theorem and torricelli's law now we are starting the new topic heat and thermodynamics and the first one in this is temperature thermometer and briefly kinetic theory of gases you see if you take a bottle out from a refrigerator bottle of water you find it is cooler than the water coming out of a tap similarly if you touch a cup of tea you find it hot so our sense of touch can give us some guidance as to whether things are cooler or hotter but they don't serve always sometimes they can confuse you and moreover they do not tell you how hot or how cold so these questions two questions that they may not confuse you and then the question of how hot or cold they are tackled by two things one is question of how is tackled by assigning temperature to a body and measuring this temperature with a device called thermometer so by measuring by a thermometer we can tell whether it is how much hotter it is than something else so we will talk of temperature and thermometer before going further let us remember that the temperature is a bulk property of a system this means that a temperature can be assigned only to a very large assembly of particles it cannot be assigned to individual particles for example in this room there is lot of gas i can assign the temperature to the whole or at least to a certain region in this room to the to gas in that region not to individual particles of the gas so temperature is a bulk property it can be assigned only to large assemblies of particles and when can the temperature be assigned when bodies are in thermal equilibrium what is thermal equilibrium let us see i have here two bodies this is at a higher temperature this is at lower temperature and if i establish a thermal contact between them then the heat will flow from body at higher temperature to the body at lower temperature and ultimately the temperature becomes equal when the temperature becomes equal we say that these two bodies are in thermal equilibrium so if there are two bodies which are not exchanging heat with one another they are in thermal equilibrium in this room if the the gas and other things are not exchanging heat they are all in equilibrium and i can assign temperature to them remember temperature is a bulk property can be assigned only to a very large assembly of particles not to individual particles associated with the concept of thermal equilibrium is the zeroth law of thermodynamics which says if a body a is in thermal equilibrium with c another body b is also in thermal equilibrium with c then a and b themselves must also be in thermal equilibrium this is known as zeroth law of thermodynamics and if all these three are in equilibrium then i can assign a temperature to them caution it must be mentioned here that in thermodynamics temperatures are always expressed in absolute scale so remember this one second when a system is in thermal equilibrium it does not mean that all its particles have the same energy in fact there is an energy distribution given by maxwell boltzmann law here i show you the maxwell boltzmann distribution at three temperatures this shows that there is equilibrium but in equilibrium all particles do not have the same velocity they are there there is a distribution of velocities at that temperature now how do we measure temperatures any device that measures the temperature is called a thermometer so we have to devise a thermometer to measure temperatures and how can we devise a thermometer we will have to take some property which changes with temperature say volume of a liquid changes with temperature so we can employ volume to measure temperature electrical resistance of metals changes with temperature so we can have resistance 
thermometers which can measure temperature. Changes in pressure and volume of gases also change with temperature and we have constant volume thermometer and constant pressure gas thermometers. So, these properties are called thermometric properties. They allow us to measure temperature. And another additional property of these thermometric properties is that they should be linear. That is, if volume changes with temperature, the change in volume should be linear. If resistance changes with temperature, the change in resistance should be linear. And this, in fact, does happen when the temperature range is not very large. Over a, a moderate temperature range, volume changes linearly with temperature and resistance also changes linearly with temperature and therefore, we can employ them. The linearity of scales ensures that we can navigate with ease between various temperature scales. That means, we can interconvert from one scale to another. Since the property of change in volume of a liquid does not require any elaborate setup, we use this as temperature measuring device. Mercury thermometer is an example. You see, when I assign temperature, I also have to assign a number. For example, the my body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. 37 is a number. So, whenever we measure temperature, we have to assign a number. Now, how do we assign a number? We must have a scale on which to measure. And how do we devise a scale? For that, we need two points on every scale, melting point of ice and boiling point of water at specified conditions are chosen because these do not change very much. They are very stable points, melting point of ice and boiling point of water at specified conditions. Melting point of ice at specified condition is 0 degrees on Celsius scale and boiling point of temperature on Celsius scale at specified conditions is 100 degrees. So, we make use of this, but in modern times the melting point of ice has been replaced by the triple point of water. What is triple point? Triple point is a point at which all three phases gas, liquid and solid are in equilibrium. This chemists find is a very stable point and this has now been used to in, in preference to the melting point of ice. So, you are familiar with Celsius scale, so I, I need not worry too much. The other scale that we used is Fahrenheit scale. Remember, for scientific purposes, we use only Celsius scale. In many countries, Fahrenheit scale is still used. On this scale, you know, the temperature of melting ice is 32 degrees Fahrenheit and the temperature of boiling water at fixed at, at certain conditions at uh, standard conditions is 212 degrees. And you can, you know, convert how to convert from one scale to another. You need to formalize F minus 32 by 180 equal to C by 100. You are all familiar with this and you can see that the temperature of human body when the human is healthy is 37 degrees and this 37 degrees when converted to Fahrenheit gives 98.6 degrees. So, that is easy. In fact, you can have any scale. If the scale is linear, then you can convert from one scale to another and here is this formula and in terms of the end points of the two scales. You can see this and use this to convert from one scale to another scale. The temperature actually theoretically is defined by thermodynamics. We shall study that a little more later and you know the equation of state is P v equal to mu r t and if P is constant then V varies as t and if V is constant then P varies as t and I have drawn both volume against temperature and pressure against temperature. What is the importance of this? The importance is that if I have two gases, ideal gases, gas 1 and gas 2 and if I plot volume against temperature, then if I extend them backward, then they must meet at a certain point and that point is defined as absolute 0 of scale and this scale is called absolute scale or the Kelvin scale. This is 0 k and therefore, the 0 of Celsius scale becomes 273.15 k and so on. Now, what does it mean? 
the same thing happens with the pressure gas 1 gas 2 if i plot pressure against temperature again if i extend them backwards they meet at the same point at absolute zero it means that all activity must stop at zero absolute zero this cannot happen therefore absolute zero cannot be achieved in fact this is a law of thermodynamics which we shall not study in class 12 but later that the zero of the absolute zero is not achievable theoretically you cannot get it experimentally also you cannot reach absolute zero what is kinetic theory of gases as the name suggests kinetic that means it has to do with the motion of particles and to do this theory we will have to make certain assumptions and what are those assumptions one the number of molecules is very large the number of particles in the of the gas is very large yet the volume occupied by these particles is small compared with the total volume of the gas the molecules are continuously moving and their motion is completely random that is they are moving in all directions there are frequent collisions between particles and particles themselves and particles and the walls of the container and these con are assumed to be perfectly elastic there is no interaction between molecules except during collisions and lastly at high temperature and low pressure conditions are generally such that a gas behaves more like an ideal gas so what is kinetic interpretation of temperature kinetic energy associated with each degree of freedom is half k b times t where k b is boltzmann constant a monoatomic gas for example has 3 degrees of freedom it can move this way it can move this way and it can move uh, this way so there are 3 degrees of freedom and with each degree of freedom we assign kinetic energy half k b t therefore the total kinetic energy with 3 degrees of freedom is 3 by 2 k b times t and this is equal to half m b square where m is the mass of the particle and from this we can associate kinetic energy with temperature that is the explanation of temperature in the kinetic theory of gases since the particles are in, in continuous motion they collide among themselves as well as with the walls of the container and therefore they put pressure on the walls it doesn't matter which kind of wall is this or which shape of the wall is as we shall see it doesn't matter so let us focus attention on one particle say i take particle here which is moving with velocity vx in the positive x direction this comes in contact they moves and collides with wall a and if the collision is perfectly elastic as we have assumed then this particle goes with velocity v collides with the wall comes back with velocity minus vx that means the change in momentum the magnitude of the change in momentum is 2 m vx and the same change in momentum would be there on the wall itself because the momentum must be conserved now this particle next time will collide after it goes to the other wall hits it comes back and then collides with this wall what time does it take the distance it has to travel is 2 l this length is l therefore the distance travel goes here and then comes back distance travel is 2 l velocity is it vx therefore the time taken would be 2 l by vx and the frequency therefore of these collisions that is the number of collisions per second would be vx by 2 l and therefore the change of momentum the rate of change of momentum would be delta px by delta t which is momentum in one collision into the frequency of collisions and this is vm vx squared by l and this rate of change of momentum is actually force and this is the force that is applied to the wall a and the force has magnitude m vx squared by l to find the pressure on the wall or the force acting on the wall we must take all particles into account so far we have discussed only one particle we have to take all particles into account so what we do is we sum over all the particles we say that the force is m by l j v j x squared j is we sum over j j is jth particle we take and we sum over j how do we do that this is here it is tricky so please understand m by l of course is common this v j x squared we average over all particles and the number of particles is n and we take 
the average of the square velocity v x square. Why do we take the average of the square? Because if we take the average of velocity itself, it will be 0. Because particles are moving in all directions, therefore the velocity would be 0. However, if we take the average of the square, then it will not be 0. Therefore, the force becomes m by l into n into the average of v x squared for the x direction. Similarly, we have to do with y and z directions. So, what do we do? We know particles are moving at random. Therefore, the probability of particle moving in the x direction is the same as the in the y direction as in the z direction. Therefore, the average of v x square is equal to the average of v y square equal to the average of v z square. And therefore, the average of v square is simply the v x square average plus v y square average plus v z square average. And from this equation, we get v x square average is 1 by 3 the average of v square. So, we substitute this and we get the force is 1 by 3 m l n the average of v square. That is the force that is exerted on the wall A. Finally, the pressure on the wall A is P equal to the force divided by the area of A. And what is the area of A? Area of A is L w d. Let me show you the wall. This is d and this is w width and this is depth. This is L. So, the area of cross section A is d times w. So, it becomes 1 by 3 m by L divided by w d into n the average of E square. This is 1 by 3 m n L w d becomes volume. So, n by V the volume and multiplied by the mean v square and this becomes 1 by 3 m n mean v square. That is the expression from the kinetic theory of the pressure exerted on a wall by particles moving in all directions. Small n is n by v the number density of particles that is the number of particles per unit volume. You see it is very interesting and significant that pressure, pressure is a macroscopic quantity. Pressure is defined on the basis of a large number of particles, is a bulk property, has been expressed in terms of the average kinetic energy of each particle, which is a microscopic quantity. So, this relationship between macroscopic and microscopic you must note. And second is that the final result does not depend on the dimensions of the container or on the surface that we considered. It does not matter. Whatever the shape of the container, whatever the dimensions of the wall. In fact, even if there is an imaginary surface somewhere inside the container, even then the pressure exerted on this wall would be the same that we have derived above. And finally, there is an important point to be made. It is not necessary that the same particle that starts at one wall will travel up to the other wall. You see, we said particle goes here, strikes, comes back. It may not be the same particle. You see, remember that we have infinite number of particles. If this particle does not do, then another particle be, can be found moving in that direction and we take that particle into account. So, the expression that we have derived for that, it is not important that the same particle will go here, strike, strike here, come back and like that. Because there is infinite number of particles moving in all directions, the expression for pressure that we have derived is the correct one. In this lecture, we have discussed temperature, how to measure it, what are the uh, properties that are needed for its measurement and so on. And we have also seen the kinetic interpretation of temperature. In the next lecture, we shall take the first law of thermodynamics.